ist an. Okay, nein, das ist nicht. Hat Verzögerung. Okay. Hör auf, wieder drauf zu drücken. <lacht> <lacht> yes, we, we did the turn it off and on again trick. Can you all hear me now? Okay, super. Thank you very much for coming. Um, this is Arne, my name is Gunnar, we are both from the Apollo team. Uh, as you all know, the Apollo team are Amiga fans and our mission is to revive the Amiga. And today uh, we welcome you to our second episode of our homeschooling. The idea of the homeschooling is to teach you how to program the Amiga and to explain you why the Amiga is such a great computer in our opinion and what we really like about the Amiga chipset and the 68K CPU. As you might know, I did design the Super Ega chipset and the 68080 CPU. I used to work for IBM as a CPU and a software developer before. I also worked for Huawei, Huawei called in Germany, um, designing their units of their new ARM chips. So I have a little bit of experience in CPU development and um, also did program low level basically every CPU on the planet from Intel to MIPS to Alpha, Power, PC and the 68K of course. In my opinion the 68K is a very special CPU which is a little bit underrated today. I think it has excellent features and today I would like to show you some of those. So welcome to the second part. We will start with um, a quick recap, a quick uh, summary, just a few minutes of the first part to get us all back again on the same level. For those which visited the first part and maybe have a question, um, please ask now. Maybe we can explain them right in advance. Um, I also would like everyone during the stream, please be so kind. And if you find something confusing, not well explained or need a little bit more explanation, please tell us right away and we can help you help everyone to, to have the same understanding. Okay, Anne, could you please be so kind and got myself something to drink? Um, show us the presentation that we prepared in advance. Okay, so welcome to our homeschooling. God. We are. Quickly doing a summary of episode one. Last month we had. Uh, we spoke about the design of the Amiga and about the chipset. Today we will try to cover episode 2 uh, and hope you all can learn something about the 68K and becoming a GD Jedi Master hopefully soon in the next episodes we will start programming demos or games. Okay, Let's go back to episode 1, the design of the Amiga. If you look at the Amiga mainboard, you see there's a CPU. The job of the CPU is to execute the instructions. Every program is built up, constructed out of many uh, instructions, and the CPU runs at a very high speed and thus execute millions of instructions per second. The RAM, the memory on the Amiga, 50 
512 kilobyte we had on the Amiga 500. This memory contains all the program code, this means all the instructions, and to the computer the instructions are also only numbers. It, con it contains also all the data of the program you're running, of the game. So it contains the information of where the objects are placed in the level, how many hit points your um, character has, and so on and so forth. It contains all the graphics that you see. This is also inside the memory chips. And all the audio data. So all the explosion sounds, all the sounds of the music, everything is also in the memory. The Amiga is famous for its custom ships. And on the main board we have three custom ships. Uh, one in the middle, called Agnes, is the DMA controller. The job of the DMA controller is to fetch data from the memory and to provide this data to the other custom ships. Also, another job of the Agnes is to act as gatekeeper for the CPU. So if DMA is running, or audio is given out, video is given out, the CPU can at the same time obviously not talk to the memory. So Agnes has a time scheduling sh scheme and allows the CPU when there is free time. Got to knock up. That will not be it. Okay. Finger <laughs> big. <laughs> okay. Denise. Denise is famous ship of the Amiga. Denise does create the video out. Can Denise contains all the color registers and does not only do the playfield graphics but also the sprites. Paula ship is a DJ and does all the audio. We have physical sh ships, Agnes, Denise, Paula, and inside these physical ships, from the programming point of view, we have logical units. We have the planes, we have the sprites, we have the audio channels. And we have the DMA channels, the Blitter and the Copper. Okay. So, can you the Scheren wegmachen? Do we have any questions so far? To this summary. Is this all clear? Do you all recall this? Okay, then let's continue. Kannst du es wieder nach vorne machen, Anna? Okay, so here we have a nice picture of the Amiga ships. Agnes is a square, big one. Denise contains the sprites. Paula does the audio. Let us look at the logical units inside the ship set. As you recall, the Denise ship contains the color registers and the OCS ship set of the Amiga 500 did have 32 of those. The AGA upgrade provided us 256 color registers. Denise supports eight planes. With AGA this was extended no, six planes, and with AGA this was extended to eight planes, sorry. Sprites, we always had eight. With AGA the sprites got a little bigger. Paula offers four audio channels. Um, Super AGA does increase this a little bit. So the Super AGA chipset has 1024 color registers. Not 250 like AGA, but four times. 
the Super AGI chipset has eight planes and also two chunky playfields. The sprites are also upgraded in the Super AGI chipset and um, can now have not only three colors per sprite but 16 colors. The audio channels were also improved in the Super AGI chipset and we now have eight audio channels and they also support not only 8-bit samples but 16-bit or dual 16-bit stereo. Agnes is our DMA controller. It provides and fetches all the data information for the planes and sprites. And it also contains the blitter and the copper, which we know as programmable units in the Amiga. All those ships that you see on the main board are, from a programming point of view, put into a memory space. This means the CPU, which you as a programmer control and you write the program for, has its program code in the memory, in the ship memory, and also its data in the ship memory, and it can see the Amiga custom ships in a certain memory range. The memory range where it sees the Amiga custom ship is DFF000 to DFF200. This is the range where all the registers of the Amiga chipset are placed. The Super AGA chipset does extend this range, so there are also registers in DFF300 and 400 in the Super AGA chipset, but the, the way to use them is just the same like the normal previous custom ship registers. The ships use the space for communication with the CPU. The CPU can put values there, and this is like giving the registers instructions, commands, telling them what to do. You can poke a register, you can move a value there in your CPU code, and this will change the volume of the audio. Or you can change the position of your mouse pointer on screen. Or you can change the color of the screen. So everything, all these values, all these attributes are in registers complete list of registers um, is also visible online on the Apollo Core website. Let's have a very quick look at the schema of the Amiga 500. We have as a big piece the CPU. The CPU is connected with wires directly to the kickstart and can talk to the kickstart all the time. It can also talk to Agnes. Agnes, as gatekeeper, does control the access to the memory ships and to the registers inside Denise and Paula. All those registers that the CPU can talk to, those DFF registers, they either belong to Denise, the color registers, or the audio registers belong to Paula, and everything which is related to DMA, to the blitter and so on, is in Agnes. From the CPU point of view, this is Korean. It does not know in which ship which register is. It only sees the numbers and the, reg uh, the ships react correctly on this. The CPU can talk to the memory when the memory is not used for displaying pixels. So there's a, uh, an interleaved way of memory access. Plain CPU, plain CPU, plain CPU. And the CPU gets basically a very good speed until you enable too many planes. So if you enable more than four planes, the CPU will slow down, will start to slow down on the OCS machines. Okay, so let's go back to this here. Can you. Um, Okay, um, so this is a quick wrap up, quick summary um, of our first episode. 
please tell me if anything was a little bit unclear or if we could explain one of these points a little bit better for you. Now's the time. Okay, I see no questions. That's good. Then I will continue. Um, Anna, could you please share? You have to excuse for our clumsy switching of screens. <laughs> I'm very good in programming the CPU, but doing these online streams is something new for me. Okay, let's start now with episode two. Our goal is that you all will learn a little bit more about the 68K and will learn how to master it. The 68K CPU is the brain of the Amiga. Motorola did design this CPU in the late 70s and it became a real success. It, um, the main reason it became such a big success is that it's very easy to program. It has not only very many different instructions, allowing you to do many things uh, efficiently using the right tools. It also has a very nice flat programming model. This means it has a wide address space and you map registers typically on the 68K um, in this address range. This makes using addresses, registers, ships very simple. So for the CPU there's no difference in writing a pixel on the screen, setting a color um, in a register of the Amiga chipset, changing the volume or changing the high score in a game. So you use the same instructions for all these operations. For the CPU it looks like you always talk to memory. This is very handy. This makes programming very flexible. Okay, let's continue a little bit. You will recall the picture we just saw. There was the CPU and there were the memory chips. It's important to understand a few basic things about the Amiga and the 68K CPU. In the Amiga, we have one chip memory and this memory contains the different types of things which you can have. You, you, it's all in the same ship memory on the Amiga 500. You have the program code of your game, your demo, your application there. You have all the graphics that you show there. You have all the audio there. So everything is in one memory. And every instruction which the CPU executes is also only a number. So the CPU reads its next instruction from the memory. It's always going to the memory to fetch an instruction. If it's doing some calculation, it's maybe increasing your score, it will read an instruction to increase the score. Part of reading this instruction to increase the score will be reading the score, then it will increase it, add maybe one to it, and then it will write it back to memory. So you see there's a lot of operations going on all the time with the memory. So it's, it's very much working with the memory all the time. Uh, the 68K is a two operand machine and you have registers. Let's look at this picture again. So here we have the CPU in the blue square and the CPU has 24 address lanes in the Amiga 500. 24 address lanes allow the CPU to talk to 16 megabytes of address space. This is not only the ship memory, but it could be memory expansions in the sorrow range. It could be the sheep ranger expansion. It could be the registers of the chipset. Every thing of every of these things and also the kickstart are placed into this 16 megabyte range. 16 bit of data lanes coming out of the 68K CPU and go to the Agnes and go to the memory. This means 
on the Amiga 500, you can with one bus cycle, with one read, read 16 bits. This is two bytes. If the 68K in the Amiga 500 wants to read more, like a long, which is four bytes, two cycles are used for that on the bus. This means reading a long takes twice as long as reading a word or reading a byte. If you read a byte, then in fact the CPU will read always a word, which is two bytes, and only use the byte you really want of those. So it does not have a, a mean or a possibility to read less than 16 bits in one go. So, let's talk about the two operand machine. The 68K is a two operand machine. What is meant by this? Meant by this is that one instruction has a source operand and a destination operand. So you typically in one instruction do A plus B and you save the result, the sum of these both, back into B. Every operation the 68K CPU does works like that. You can add two numbers, you can subtract two numbers, but you always store the result back in the second operand. Why is the 68K a two operand machine? Well, two operand machines can solve every problem you want as a programmer. If you have 1000 numbers that you want to sum up to one result, you take two of those, add them together and save it. Then you take the third, add it again on the same result. You take the fourth and so on. So you can repeat this operation and can this way sum up whatever kind of numbers you want. So it's flexible. You can with a two operand machine solve every problem. There are also other machines which are called three operand machines. The difference between a three operand and a two operand machine is that the result in a, with using a three operand machine can be saved to a different location than the two sources were. This means you can write on a three operand machine a plus B store in C. This is elegant and sometimes you need this. To do this on the 68K you would need to do put B into C add A to C. So you have then two operations you would do on the 68K to do this same result a three operand machine would do in one operation. So you say a three operand machine is more flexible and can do more? Yes, that's true. But can we beide uns sehen, das meine, dass wir can we das machen halb und ich auch halb? Keine Ahnung. Warte mal. Okay. Okay, so on a three operand machine you can do more in one instruction. You can say A plus B should be stored in C without overwriting B. This looks good and this is right. This is more flexible. There's a reason why the 68K doesn't do it this way and I can explain it. To store three operands in each and every instruction, you need a lot of space. This means the instructions become very big. Statistics show, and you as a programmer will also experience this when you work a little bit, that most of the time, or very often, you need two operands. So doing two things together, adding something to your high score, lowering your life's uh, increasing the coordinate of a bullet on the screen 
these are typical two operand operations and these two operand operations are very very often used so the 68k instruction set is tuned for that to encode instructions with two operands you need less space and having less space in your instruction means your programs become much shorter this is why our programs on the 68k are always so short because the machine is tuned for two operands you can do what a three operand machine does by using two instructions on the 68k first the move to move one of the operands to the result and then do the operation of the result like i explained so you can do everything a three operand machine does and you need the same space the bigger space of two small instructions have the same typically the same size as one bigger so for the rare case that you need three operands the 68k is about as memory efficient as a three operand machine but for the more common case that you only need two operands we save a lot of space and this is why amiga programs can be so small um there's a comment yeah ozzy is right the o80 is also a three operand machine and can work in both ways it sees when you want to do a three operand operation by doing a move and a normal instruction and it will combine those two instructions fuse them we call this fusing and executes them in one instruction in a single cycle or half a cycle this means the 68 or 80 combines both benefits it has the short instructions and the higher speed of the three operand machine um, I think we have some more questions. Anna, can you help me? Yeah, Jada. Ah, Guy is asking, can you choose which audio channels go to the left or right on Super HEA? Yes, you can. On the original old Amiga chipset, we did have four audio channels, and each audio channel had one volume register. This means um, you could per channel change and define the volume which is very handy so you could say certain I don't know sounds I have a certain volume maybe a medium volume and a big explosion has a higher volume so you could very efficiently in high quality also play um, not so loud music um, without lowering the, the bits you needed for them you could keep the full quality but just lower the volume per, per per voice but the side where the voice was was hardwired on the main board so you always had two vo voices on the left and two voices on the right with the amiga 1200 they changed this a little bit it was still hardwired but they made an analog loop so they put a little bit of each channel on the other side as well um, this made the music not so uh, clinical it, it sounded more natural so if you had headphones uh, on um, the, the voice was not 100% on that side but a little bit more in the room and this is something we changed or upgraded on the Super AGA ship, now each of the eight audio channels does has two volume registers. So you have a volume for the left and for the right, and you can for each channel position the voice where you want. You can also switch a channel to a mode that it spits out not one sample but two samples at the same time one for the left and one for the right so this means like you have on your cd um, cd quality track you have a stereo track with left and right and you can play this 100 percent back just using one amiga audio channel now i hope this answers the question if not please uh, ask again ozzy mentioned that there are also instructions like vperm which have more operands this is correct vamped amiga is asking is it 
run in a cycle. Uh, VPerm, you mean, I suppose? Yes, VPerm is uh, executed in a single cycle. Actually, on the 68 or 80, basically every instruction, with very, very few exceptions, is executed in one cycle. The exception would be multiply. Multiply takes two cycles. Hmm. And divide. Divide takes 18 cycles. And I spoke about the half cycle. Yes. Um, what I mean by that is the 68K originally executed um, instructions taking several cycles for one instruction. It needed four cycles for every word of instruction length. So if you have a quick instruction like for example move quick one to d0 then this instruction is very short encoded this is why it's called quick and this needs four cycle on the 68k if you move a 32-bit value to a register that mir kannst du damit mal aufhören das klimpert voll move one million to d2 then this instruction within the memory need three words six byte and it would need four times three cycle to execute this means 12 cycle because fetching a word on the 68000 took always per word it fetched four cycle so you wanted to make short instructions because short instructions were quicker on the 68080, we have changed that. The 68080 does not have a 16-bit bus. It has a 64-bit bus. It can do a memory operation 64-bit in a single cycle. It does not need four cycle for 16-bit. It can do 64-bit in just one cycle. And we have an instruction cache, which helps... Und dann sag ich Bescheid which helps to avoid needing to load instructions from the memory. The CPU can remember the last used instructions of your program loop and it can read them basically for free without taking time. The instruction cache in the 16, 68K or 80 is 16 kilobyte in size. So it can remember real big program code. Okay, move quick takes the same time as a move L. Yeah, this is correct. On the 68 or 80, basically every instruction has the same speed. You can, in the instruction cache, from the instruction cache, fetch 16 bytes in a single cycle to the CPU. This means instruction up to 16 byte length can be executed in a single cycle on the 080. In the oral times when we started, I started with the Amiga 1000, we used to learn and read those execution numbers. How long did this instruction take? How long did that take? And we always memorized them in your, our head. So when writing a demo or some effect, you always try to find looking for a shorter, quicker alternative. And the 68K CPU is rich in options. There are overlapping instructions or overlapping possibilities, so to say. You can um, do things not only using a 32-bit instruction, you can often use a 16-bit instruction or you have short forms for example, you want often increment stuff. So you have an instruction which can add a value between 1 and 8. And this is done in a very short encoding. And therefore, the instruction is fast on the older 68Ks. And your programs are short and dense. 
So this is all good and this is benefit and the Motorola engineers did really spend a lot of time to invent optimizations here for very common cases that a programmer very often needs. And this allows you to make your program quicker and smaller. Alina is asking what VPERM does. VPERM is an AMMX instruction and it's a vector permutate. It's a little bit complicated instruction to start with. I would like to start with simpler instructions, but to answer your question, you can in VPERM take two registers, each 64 bit, 2 times 64 bit is 128 bit or in other words 16 bytes as input in VPERM and you can pick of these 16 bytes any combination of 8 bytes it could be whatever order or you could repeat one of those bytes how often you want and can define with this a result so you can permutate or select from 16 bytes, 8 you want, and reconstruct the result. This is very handy. Um, often you have pixel data in a certain format, for example 32-bit, and you want to show a 32-bit picture on a 24-bit screen, so you can rearrange with these perm instruction bytes in, a, in an appropriate manner. Um, you can also do other things like as you know, the byte order on the 68K is called Big Endian because you have on the left hand side the high value numbers. So if you write the value 1 million, you start with the 1 million, then the 100,000, then the 10,000, the 1,000, the 100, the 10, and then the uh, single digit below, behind. So you write numbers in memory in the same way you would do in the English language. Or. Now, the Intels do it the opposite way. They, if they write a million, then they start with a one, then the ten, then the hundred, then the thousand. So it's also the the other side around. And this sometimes you you want to read data which is saved or stored by by an Intel machine, and this perm instruction would be very helpful here. Or you can do a lot of more, more things. The half cycle. Let's, yeah, this was the question. We got sidetracked. Okay, on the 68000 CPU, the minimum time an instruction took was four cycle. And most instructions or many instructions took longer. So it was very common that an instruction took 8 cycles or 12. Um, this was very slow from our point of view today. Now with the O20 and O30 this got improved and the minimum time for an instruction was down to 2 cycles. So for every word of the instruction length the instruction needed 2 cycles. So a short instruction like a move quick was done in two cycle, but a move 32 bit value to a register, which is three words, six bytes, needed six cycle. So the O30 behaves from a timing point of view very much like the original 000 model, but um, just needed half the cycles for everything. But it has the same behavior that longer instructions took longer. The O40 tried to break with that. The O40 it had a good instruction cache width and it basically did always like two operations in one cycle. So a normal instruction normally took on the O40 one single cycle and it could do the, it didn't matter if this instruction was one byte or two bytes or three bytes, because the O40 was reading up to eight bytes from the instruction cast per cycle. So O60 added two pipes. This means it could execute two instructions in parallel. 
this is super this is very cool this was a great improvement and great achievement unfortunately the 060 was also the last model they made and they were under financial and time pressure and it was a very complicated ship so at some point um, they ran so to say out of time and they had to deliver the ship with how it was even if they were not 100% happy with it. The original Motorola development team did want to add more stuff or did want to to improve the 060 actually and they originally planned to bring the 060 out as a pre-version and develop their ships they really wanted to do as an 060B afterwards. But as you all know this never happened. It was planned but I mean Motorola decided to, to not continue on the 68K line because the development time to make a 68K CPU was so high Motorola had really problems on the market to sell their ships because when you develop a ship you aim for a certain technology a certain transistor size where you design it for this means when you start the development of a ship and a new transistor size is whatever 90 nanometers for example and you start to develop for that and you need three years and now in the three years came out uh, 65 nanometers then you bring out a 90 nanometer CPU to the market while your competitors which might have a simpler design which maybe only needs one year to develop bring at the same time a ship with 60 na nanometers so you have a very high disadvantage your ships are slower um, bigger more costly because the as smaller the nanometers are as cheaper um, the same number of transistors becomes because they need less space so if you you are behind two or three years compared to the others your ships are bigger more costly and less fast so this gives you a big disadvantage and Motorola was experiencing this development or this um, problem in the early 90s. Um, their ships up to the 030 were basically okay-ish. And then the, the time in, in which um, the transistors technology improved became very short. There were a lot of shrinking in the transistors and their ships at the same time became more complex. The 040 was a very complicated CPU, so they needed longer to develop it. And they couldn't bring their ships at the same pace, speed to the market as the competitors, which made more, much more simpler ships. And because of this, the Motorola ships in comparison, when they reached the markets, were slower and pretty costly compared to the others. And Motorola basically feared to go out of business and so this is the reason they decided to go away from from the 68k line it's not because the 68k line is a bad CPU it's in my opinion a great CPU but I think you have to see this like you're an engineer and you're or constructor and, and, and your job is building cathedrals or churches building a cathedral takes an awful lot of time and when it's now fashion to build very cheap concrete buildings and people buy those because they are quicker to do and faster to build so this was the situation Motorola was in and, and they feared they, they cannot compete because they are too slow today this changed today the transistor improvements are not there anymore and um, today it wouldn't really matter if if you are slow in developing a CPU because the development basically slowed down also very much um, but Motorola unfortunately dropped the ball or panicked and ran away um, and the 080 is now what I believe the Motorola people always wanted to do and would have done and the 080 can execute up to four instructions per cycle Typically it's two, but in theory it can do four. And it 
has the bandwidth to read 16 bytes per cycle. So if you execute two instructions effectively, this makes it feel like each instruction takes half a cycle. Or you can say the first instruction takes one cycle and the second takes zero cycle. From a programmer point of view, this is the same. You can do two instructions per cycle. Um, the O80 had a big flaw, in my opinion, and also in the Motorola team. The instruction cache bandwidth was just 4 byte. And 4 byte is not a lot. If you recall, um, the O30 did fetch two bytes with one operation. And the O40 did improve this, so they fetched more. They fetched eight bytes with one operation. So the O40 could execute long instructions, like six byte instructions, or four byte instructions, or eight byte instructions, in a single cycle because it could fetch this amount per cycle. So O60 added two units to execute instructions, which is cool. In theory, it could execute a lot, but it could only fetch four byte per cycle. This meant it fetched half of what an O40 was fetching. So if you write long instructions, the O60 is much slower even than an O40 because it can only fetch half as many bytes from the iCache per cycle. So this is a big flaw in the O60, which um, the original Motorola engineers never wanted to be there, and which was originally planned for the B model to be fixed, which never came to the market. We fix this, we fetch four times the amount of bytes than the O60, and this means you can write whatever kind of instruction you want, um, everything is executed always fast. And these improvements that I explain here are the reason why the O80 is so fast. It's not because the O80 is high clocked. We could, if we would build an ASIC, for which we just need half a million dollar. So if here someone has some funds he, he likes to donate to us to help us revive the Amiga, please tell us. Um, our goal is at the end to make an ASIC and this ASIC will allow us with our CPU design to reach a gigahertz or two. In FPGAs, by design of how an FPGA is working and constructed, you cannot reach that high speed. We, for example, at IBM, we did develop ships like the Cell, which was running at four gigahertz or other fast power PC machines. And we did test them also in FPGAs. And these high-end cores, which in an ASIC ran at several gigahertz, reach 20 megahertz or 30 megahertz in an FPGA. So it's by nature that stuff in an FPGA always runs much slower. Our CPU, our O80 CPU, reaches 85 megahertz in the Vampire. This is pretty high clock rate for a CPU in an FPGA. This is very high clock rate, especially for the complexity the O80 has. The O80 is not a very simple CPU which can just execute one instruction. It can execute up to four instructions in parallel. So this is really a heavy lifter. I see we have more questions. On the O8, uh, 68K, you have 16 data li lanes. Does this mean a byte takes longer than a word? Uh, a byte is 8 bit. A byte needs, needs 8 data lines. A word on the Amiga is 16 bit. Both a byte and a word could be transmitted over the 16 bit bus. In a single cycle, if you move a long word along, this is 32 bits, this needs two bus cycles. So working with longs on the Amiga 500 took longer, <laughs> twice as long. This was changed in the later models, the Amiga 3000, 4000, 
1200 and CD32 upgraded the bus to have 32 lanes. This means you could move byte, word and long at the same speed. So a byte operation took one cycle, a word operation took one cycle and a long operation took also one bus cycle. It does, didn't matter anymore. Our 080 ship has a 64-bit bus. For us it does not matter if you move a byte, a word, a long or a quad which is four words or eight bytes. You can move eight bytes in a single bus cycle on the OS80. Did Motorola, Motorola ever do something towards O80 or was this developed entirely by the Apollo team? Motorola did do the O60 and they plan to do the O60B. Um, those ships are gone. Um, we had a, did had a meeting with Motorola a long time ago. We spoke. Um, to the vice president of Motorola, of Rescale, the ship department, uh, many years ago when we started the Natami project because we wanted to ask Motorola to restart 060 production. At that point already, many years ago, over 10 years ago, 060 production was stopped for quite a while. And because we wanted to revive the Amiga, we did ask Motorola if they could restart production and how much money we need to collect or how many units we need to buy that it made sense for them. We were hoping if we come and make a plan that we buy 10,000 ships, um, we could make a deal. And they were basically laughing in our face and say, they liked our project, they liked, liked, did like what we wanted to do and they wanted to help us, but they said they, they have no means to restart the 060 production. And this is like 14 years ago. They explained to us that the fab where they used to build the O60 is dismantled already. So this is gone. They didn't have the fab anymore. So, so the whole buildings, everything was gone and they couldn't produce it anymore. And to produce it on a new fab in a different technology, they would need it to go back to the drawing board and basically this is like building Rome from the ground up. You need to dismantle the whole, reconstruct the whole city on a different place. So this is a huge task. This needs, needs a lot of time. And they, they told us they didn't even have the blueprints anymore of the O60. And the original team at that time did, was in pension homes or dead. So this was a... We, they would have needed to start from scratch, absolutely from scratch. Well, like the Americans when they would fl wanted to fly to the moon right now, they don't have the rockets anymore, everything is gone, the pilots are gone. They would need to start their, their moon project from, from the beginning. And they told us this takes a lot of money and even if we would put here in Austin on the table a million dollars, this wouldn't be enough. And so, so this was... Uh, <laughs> Um, disappointing for us a lot, but we understood this, of course, because um, the, the people from the Natami team, me and uh, Thomas and Jens and Christoph, we were involved in, in making CPUs, power CPUs at IBM. Uh, at, at that point of time, IBM was producing the CPUs for uh, for Macintosh, um, this is G5, and, and IBM was producing the cell chip um, for the PlayStation 3. And we knew that these developments typically had a, a price tag around 40, 50 million dollar for developing such a ship. And this is why we hoped that they would have the blueprints and everything ready and they wouldn't need to develop anything and we would get away with a much cheaper deal. But now that they learned that they didn't have that, it was a, a no option, right? I mean, I didn't have 40 million. So this um, was unfortunately not possible, so we had to either give up on reviving the Amiga or we would have needed to look for a different solution. And a different um, solution would have been to use the cold fire, for example. And the cold fire was what Motorola people uh, proposed us at that point. The cold fire is a middle thing 
between the original 68k and the competing cheaper to build wrist chips. The cold fire uses a nice instruction set of the 68k but it has simplified it a little bit. It has left away a lot of the options that the 68k did has to make the CPU simpler. For example, the 68000 supports different length instructions. You can have 2 byte instructions, 4 byte instructions, 6 byte, 8 byte, and 10 byte instructions. So an instruction can be up to 10 byte lengths. With the O20, they even increased this. An O20 can have up to 22 byte long instructions. This is a huge instruction because it can very complicated define the addresses and say basically like in an excel sheet take that page and there's this row and there's this column and from there the value and then you add something on top of that and and, and moves this to another sheet on another excel file and, and and so you can describe a com very complicated operation just in one instruction and this makes the instructions pretty long of course, decoding such an instruction is also a very complicated task. As longer the instruction becomes, as more complicated for the CPU is to do all this. So we support all this in an O80, um, but Motorola decided that they could make the CPUs a lot more simple by dropping the complicated sh stuff. And they kept only instructions which are 2-byte, 4-byte and 6-byte long. Everything else they cannot do. And if you start new, so for, if you develop something new, like for example uh, a music MP3 player in a USB stick or so, or you, you, you develop a control for uh, a setup box or for a television screen or something from the scratch then the cold fire is a really nice cpu it offers flexibility more flexibility than the rest ships has have it has better readable instructions it is nicer to program but it is from the production point of view of motorola a lot simpler and a lot cheaper to develop than a real 68k so it's somewhere in the middle and from our point of view, this was an option. Motorola offered us this, these ships, and at that point of time, they also had a roadmap to develop new models, and they aimed for producing these in up to 800 megahertz. So this looked for us very um, interesting at that point of time because we thought, okay, if this is true that they will bring out these faster ships, we could make Amigas at a pretty nice clock rate even if the CPU is from the power and the capabilities not as strong as the original 68k was it shares still a lot of the good points so we um, did a development project with them and evaluated their CPUs uh, we also got access to the secret Cold Fire 5 which was not um, officially ever produced uh, I know it was there um, but the, what we learned or what our research showed was that the cold fire was not designed for high performance as the 040 and 060 were and the memory controller of the cold fire is in comparison very weak and memory is for the performance of the system very important. So the memory performance of the cold fire before is very weak and we did disassembly the whole kickstart at that point of time kick operating system kickstart 3.1 and we, we profiled it and we measured how many of the instructions that the cold fire has are executed in the kickstart and how many instructions does the amiga kickstart use that the cold fire not has and you could on the cold fire emulate those missing instructions by trapping to software routines which did the equivalent 
just in many more cold fire instructions um, but this typically had a very very um, high price so so if you ran into a missing instruction emulating that with several cold fire instructions costed you in the order of 100 cycles so while on the 040 you, you needed the typically one cycle per instruction the cold fire also needed one cycle per instruction this was nice but if you hit did hit a missing instructions it cost you 100 cycles so as the amiga operating system was not open source you could not just recompile it and use more of these instructions that the cold fire had on the Atari side you could do this, right? The Atari side has these emotors which you could recompile so they could much easier switch to a cold fire. We on the Amiga wanted at that point of time of course to run the original Amiga software and the Amiga Kickstart and our research or statistics showed it's absolutely impossible to do. The performance um, was terrible. So we did spend t quite some time here because especially the option that Motorola did plan for much higher clock chips sounded like a nice option to keep the much better programmability of the 68K in comparison for example to the PowerPC. The PowerPC is very bad to co program in comparison to the 68K and it's not really no fun. Um, the cell, yeah, the cell was for the PlayStation 3, and the cell was really a killing machine. It was reaching over, um, as we ran it at IBM at 4 gigahertz, it was sold by Sony at uh, 3.6 gigahertz. It's very fast. Yes, and developing our own ship was not the original plan. I mean, who would be so stupid to, to spend 15 years developing your own CPU if you could just buy it? This was the only option that we took um, to continue with our goal to revive, um, revive the Amiga. If we could have bought 060s or could have bought 800 megahertz cold fires, we would have went a much simpler road. We could have, of course, always bought a PowerPC, but um, as you know, the PowerPC is really shitty to program and it's really no fun. And so, the spirit, in my opinion, of the Amiga was always that programming is fun, that it makes fun to develop an intro, to write a boot block demo, to, to develop a game, and this is not painful to, to the coder. And uh, switching to a CPU where coding is painful is, was, in our opinion, killing the spirit of the Amiga, so we didn't want to do that. Okay. So, Anna, can you please switch screen and let us continue? We spoke about the benefit of the two operand machine. You now understand that choosing two operands for the 68K was a smart decision to allow programs to be small. It allowed you still to do the same work as three operand machine by just using two instructions, but for all the cases where you needed only two, this allowed you to save a lot of space. The CPU contains registers. We spoke before about registers being the interface to the chipset. Yes, the AGA, OCS, Super AGA chipset has registers and these registers um, are used to give information to the chipset, to tell the chipset I want the background color to be black. So you write the number of the black color in the background color register, DFF180. Or to change or set a volume, you write the volume value, zero being no volume at all, and 64 on your original Amiga would be the maximum volume. You write this in the volume register and, and the chipset will react immediately. Now the CPU also has registers. The registers in the CPU don't have any magic behind them, like that they change colors or so, but they are needed for the CPU to do its job. When the CPU executes a program, the program, as you, you know, is in the main memory. In the Mega 500 case, the program is typically in the chip memory. 
The CPU has a special register called the program counter. The program counter is pointing to the next instruction the CPU will in the next cycle load and execute. And when it's done with this instruction, it will increment the program counter to point to the next next instruction and so on and so forth. So the program point counter points always to the place in the execution of the program where your CPU right now is. And the CPU will load and execute one instruction after each other. Working with memory is a feature that the 68K can always do. You can add stuff to memory, you can move values from memory to memory around, so you always can use all the memory to your benefit and, and memory is very important for everything you do. Of course, talking to the memory takes time. We, we spoke about that. Talking to the memory took for the Amiga 500 four cycles for one bus operation. So reading a value from memory, like a byte, took four cycles. Then you added something on it and then you write the result back. This took another four cycle. So if you do a lot of mathematical operations or a bigger calculation, always working on memory does work perfectly and you have a lot amount of memory so you can have thousands of values you combine and calculate but every time you read them and you write them back time flows cycles pass so you as a coder might want to tune this and for this the 68k has special memory built in these are called data register Data register, I here wrote Dayton, <laughs> this is German, <laughs> I, I did write the, the pages first in German, so here's some leftovers, sorry for that. So the data registers allow you to keep your most used numbers in your calculation inside the CPU. This allows you, let's not switch, this allows you to optimize your code in such a way that you use the most used variables and keep them in the data registers. Using the data registers keeps your code shorter and also saves you from these transfers to the memory so your program also becomes a lot faster. In addition to the data registers of which you have 8 on the 68k and 8 at that time when the 68K came out was a huge number. Other CPUs had much less registers. And the 68K has not only 8 registers, it had 8 data registers and 8 address pointers. When you work with memory, often you copy, for example, from one area of the screen to another area some data. You want to copy a tree on the screen. And so you can have one pointer pointing to the tree and one pointing, pointer pointing to the location of the screen. And this helps you to transfer the bytes from here to there. So you have like placeholders, pointers to memory locations. And for these, the 68K has its own registers. The 68K is a very, very, very special architecture that it separates logically between calculations and pointers to memory. Not all architectures work that way. This is a very clean part of the 68K and when we come to the pipeline this will make a lot of sense to you. And okay let's go back to the page please Arne. So the last register is the status register. Every instruction that you do at the end of the operation will update the status register and the status register basically remembers which result so to say the last operation it had not the number in value but it will remember was the result of the last operation positive or negative 
was the result zero or not zero. So these are the kinds of things it will remember and you can use this information in your next instruction. This is very useful when you, for example, program stuff like does the user click the mouse? You compare then the mouse the register and there the bit of the mouse button. So you check the bit of the mouse button. And after this check, the status register will contain the status yes or no for being was the button pressed or not. And you can in your next instruction um, reference this and say, okay, when the button was pressed, then please go to the routine which makes uh, us shoot a bullet. So you can do comparison instruction and based on the result, change program flow. This is a very important feature and programming does, is based on this. The registers of the 68K CPU are 32-bit wide. And um, the, the light blue here is a byte. This is 8 bits. And these bits have the numbers 0 to 7. And the 0 is on the right-hand side. This is important to understand, the numbering of bits. A word is a combination of two bytes and long is a combination of four bytes. The 68 or 80 does change a few of these things. Let's go quickly go back. Of course the 68 or 80 has an instruction counter and program counter. We need to know where our instructions in memory are. So this is the same. Address registers 8. 8 addresses address registers is actually a pretty luxurious situation. Normally 8 address registers last you forever. Sometimes you want to do stuff rarely but still sometimes where eight registers might not be enough. For example, let's say you have a chunky screen like in a Doom game and you want to display this on an AGA machine. An AGA machine like Amiga 1200 the AGA machine cannot display chunky pixels like uh, a PC graphic card. So you want to convert the chunky screen, which is very advantage for you to, to calculate, into planes to be able to see it on your Amiga 1200. Now you have one chunky screen and you have eight planes in memory. If you could have now nine registers, this would be really handy because you could point to the eight planes with each of your pointers and you could with also with one of those pointers point to, to the chunky screen. And maybe you have some variables where you also want to point to and maybe you have the stack pointer where you want to point to. So in that case, to program this in a nice way, you might want to have 11 registers. You don't need more. But with 11, it would be perfect. You cannot do it this way on the 68K because I only had eight registers and one of them is typically used to point to a stack. A stack is like a, a deck of cards. It's, it's a memory area, area where you can put values on if, if you don't uh, need them right now. If typically you can push the value of one of your registers there if you need it for something else real quick and, and then reload the value from the stack. If you have not enough registers and you, you have certain values in your program that you need back in a later point, but right now you need quickly another register to work with, then the typical way a compiler does, the compiler pushes the value to the stack memory reuses the register for something else and after it does the calculation it refetches the value from the stack. A compiler developer calls this 
spilling. And you run into spilling all the time when your problem is bigger than the number of registers that you have. So on the 68K, this happens from time to time because you do not have enough registers. And if you would write such a routine like um, converting one chunky screen to eight planes, you really need to think about very clever tricks to make this not run out of registers and reload pointers during the loop all the time, right? And actually in your loop, you want to convert the data. You want to read pixel and write pixel. You do not at the same time want to save registers to the stack and read them back and save them again and read them back. If you do that, then you waste a lot of your precious bandwidth for juggling around with not having enough registers and for spilling and, and restoring them. And this really ruins the speed of all your programs. If you run into this, and the compiler will often run into this, program performance can drop a lot. Your program can run half as fast as you want because it's juggling around with pushing registers to the stack. Because we know all this, we have changed the 68 or 80 a little bit. You of course can work all the time with the memory, which is so great with the 68K. But if you want need more address registers, you now have 16 address registers to your disposal. Twice as many as the original CPU. And more often than address pointers, you know, the example with the eight planes and the chunky to planar conversion is really a rare example. Often many calculations are very happy with the eight registers of the 68K. But more often you run out of data registers. The data registers hold values that you create with your uh, CPU as a result of instructions. So the result of an addition, result of a multiplication, of shifting all these things you can put in a data register. So the mathematical operations. And for many calculations, the eight data registers are good, but for many, you actually want to have more. And here we decided to do a real upgrade. We provided 32 data registers. And this is really a huge improvement. There's really no operation which in my belief, and I, I was coding assembly for IBM, high performance assembly for years. So I think with 32 data registers plus 16 address registers, you have 48 registers to, to your availability. You can do so much with this so nicely. And you can, of course, also work with the memory. But this is really a huge improvement, in my opinion, to the coder. And you do not need to worry about running out of registers. So let me look quickly. There were a number of um, questions. Isn't it strange that a call to an open library turns the address in a data register? Why not use an address register? Yes, um, that's true. And there's maybe an explanation to this. The programming model of the 68K, the typical programming model is that you give to the 68K um, the inputs in re um, values on the stack and you return um, with a value in D0. So the typical um, way of operating is if you would have a function to do a multiplication or something, you, you push the, the numbers to, to process on the stack, you call the function, the function will pull it back from the stack, will then, then do the, the operation and will return you the value in D0. So this is a classical ABI, the interface how you should program the CPU. The Motorola engineers designed it that way, and this is how it's typically used. The Amiga guys at Commodore decided for the Amiga OS not to do it this way. 
they decided to pass two functions in the operating system, the parameters, in registers. This means you, you have a value in a register, you call the function and the function does your operation and will return you the result again in a register. You never do this with a stack. It's an obvious improvement to the original layout because you typically have the values in the registers anyway or very likely when you program. And pushing, in, in, even if they are in a different register, pushing a value from a register to another register is very quick. And you do not need a memory cycle before calling an operating system function. You do not need to push something on the stack. And the operating system function does not waste time with pushing values, pulling values back from the stack. So, and even if it would need to do this, it would need to save the values of the registers where it wants to fetch those numbers into them. So it would create a lot of memory operations. And, and the concept how the Amiga people did it, that they say, okay, the, you have registers where you give in values and the function can use also these registers um, for calculation and, and can destroy them, allows these operating system functions to, to leave away a lot of memory operations which otherwise would be needed. So this is one of the reasons Amiga OS is so very fast. Another reason is that all the operating system functions are executed in the context of the CPU. The CPU context means the stack stays the same, um, the memory layout stays the same. If you would look at, for example, Linux or Unix, then it does a real context switch. This means it would switch from user mode to supervisor mode. This would mean it would need to reload all the MMU tables. So doing a simple function call on the Amiga is super lightning fast. It's just the same as you call a function inside your own program. You can call any operating system function at the same speed as you would call a subroutine next to your code that you have right now in your demo or your game. This is very unique to the Amiga. The other operating systems means basically like a system switch and this takes hundreds and thousands of cycles. This is why Amiga OS is so lightning fast. And this is also the reason why memory protection cannot work on the Amigas. But it's a design decision. They, they choose this for a reason. Okay, so let's please continue. I'm getting sidetracked here. <laughs> So, we spoke about the registers and we looked at the width. Please remember, we number the bits from the right to the left. So, the bit with the lowest value is the bit number 0. The value in it has a value 1 or 0. zero. And here's a bit 8, is, is, my, is the first bit in the second byte has a much higher value. Its value is, when it's turned on, means 256. And the bit 31 has the highest value. It's 2 billion. Okay. Um, so please keep this in mind, how the order of the bytes is. This is different to the PowerPC order, and this is different to the order in the Intel CPUs. The PowerPC also has the byte order the same, but, for sake of confusion, the bit order is inversed. So bit 0 is the most left and the highest bit is the most right. Please mind that the 080 does extend all registers to 64 bit. So in the 080 the registers have not 32 bit, 0 to 31, but 0 to 63. Okay, let's look at something really complicated now. Let's look at the pipeline. Anne glaubt, es gibt eine Möglichkeit, beides zu sehen, mich und das, so halb, halb auf dem Screen. Ich könnte schwören. 
No, it does not work. We are trying to, to show my ugly face and the... Nah, don't do it. <laughs> Oh, okay. Don't it, it. Ah. Okay. So? Ja, und das, aber warum ist das hier so überlappt? Kannst du das OPS wegnehmen? Hm. So? Okay, I hope this works. Um very very complicated now how does the pipeline of the 68k work but this is also very very important so please if you have questions ask and please don't get frustrated if this takes a little time to explain it is a basis for you to become a 68k jedi master if you understand how the pipeline works then everything will become clear to you so let's start. The 68K CPU will execute each and every instruction in an order of six single steps. The first step is fetching the instruction from memory. For this, it will use its program counter. So it will put the program counter value on the address lines to the memory ships and tell the memory ships please give me the data word of instruction at this location the memory ship will answer and this is an instruction word which is fetched in this cycle the instruction word will be buffered into an internal instruction register you as a programmer you don't know about you, you can't see this register. It's a hidden register in the CPU. In the next cycle, this instruction word will be given to the decode unit. The decode unit will look at the number and see, okay, this instruction starts with a seven. It's a move quick. Or it will look at, oh, this instruction starts with a six. It's a branch. Or this instruction starts with a two. It's a move long. So it will just look at the instruction and decode it. It will find out what you're doing in this instruction and it will pass this information into a another hidden decode register. And this decode register will be passed to all the other units in the ship and tell them what to do with this instruction. In the next pipeline stage of the CPU, the CPU will calculate the effective address, EA. The effective address is the address which the CPU can use as a source or destination operand in an operation. So you as a programmer can say, I want to write the color value black, which is 0000, zero, zero, zero to the background color register. So the address I want to talk to is DFF180. So in this case, the address would just be written in the instruction and the address units would take the address out of the instruction and put on the memory bus to talk to the custom ship, in this case to Denise. You could also have a pointer pointing to the custom ship set. And this address pointer could point to the color register. So your instruction instead saying, putting the value directly in the instruction could tell the CPU, please use a pointer that points to the color register. So the AI unit owns all the address registered. It will read in each cycle the needed number of registers and it will perform the address calculation. Sometimes an address is not just a number, but you can combine two or three numbers. You can add up several registers to point to a certain spot in memory. 
this address of the address operation comes out of the EA unit. And now in the next step, we will put this address on the bus. Let's say we want to talk um, to the seer to see if the mouse button is pressed. So we would ask the ship being located at BFE001 address and ask it to please give us its content. So we would read in that case from the memory. So this is a cycle where a 68k instruction can read from memory. The ship will answer and it will tell us the bits and now we are at the operation stage, the ALU. The ALU does all the processing of the mathematical or logical operations the CPU can do. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, divide, all this can be executed and are executed in the ALU. The ALU has two inputs, we are two operand machine, and it will always write the result back to the second input. So we can add two registers together, D0 plus D1, and we will store the result back in D1. Or we can say add something coming out of memory to D2. So we will read both, do the addition and store the result in D2. So the ALU owns the data register. Let's remember this. The fetch unit owns the program counter. The program counter belongs to the fetch unit and it's used for every instruction we load. And the decoding unit will tell the fetch unit how long the instruction was. And these number of bytes will be added to the program counter. So the program counter might point to the byte number 100 and we might load a six byte instruction and the decoding unit will tell the fetch unit, buddy, you just gave me a six byte instruction. Thank you very much. And the fetch unit will add then six to the program counter and will fetch the next instruction from the address 106. The EA unit owns all the address registers. We did have eight address registers on the old 68k ships. We now have 16 of those on the new one. And we can use those for address calculations. And some address modes do not just use the registers, but also can for free increment them or decrement them. This is very handy. Often you want to go to a memory like your screen and you will want to clear it or you want to copy something there. So incrementing the next address to point to the next pixel is an operation you want to do. Some other processors need for this operation an extra instruction. But not so the 68K. The 68K can decrement or increment pointers for free as part of the instruction. And this incrementing and decrementing is part of what the EA unit does. Here again, it's a cache access, memory read access. Here we read from memory. We have as input the um, calculated address from the previous unit and we have the decoding information to know if we want to read or not. And the ALU has as input the memory or if the instruction did contain embedded an immediate number, this is part of the decoding stuff coming here to the ALU. And of course we have in the information to the ALU also the type of job it needs to do. Do we want to add do we want to multiply? Do we want to shift something? So this information is passed to the ALU. And the ALU will create a result. And this result will, in the last stage, be written back either to the register, if we had a register, second source, or to the memory. So we can, in one instruction, fetch. Um, oh, the operation done in one instruction is fetching the instruction from memory, D1 
decoding, calculating, reading one of the inputs from memory, doing the operation and writing the result back to memory. You see, one instruction can often involve three memory operations. One to fetch instruction, one to read an operand from memory, and one to write a result back. We work a lot with memory. And on the 68000 CPU, yeah, on the 68 O80 CPU, uh, O0 CPU, sorry, um, each memory cycle took four CPU cycles. So if you operated with memory, this took more time and made your instructions slower. Now on the O80 we have a very good quality cache. You can in each instruction read from the cache this means the data read, if it's remembered in, in the last use, 64 kilobytes. Yes, the O80 has 64 kilobyte data cache. This is the amount of memory the whole Commodore 64 did have externally. We have this inside the CPU and it ca can remember the most used 64 kilobytes of data. And you can read from this for free as part of the instruction and you can write to back to this for free as part of the instruction. So this now does not need any cycles anymore. This is the reason why the 80 is so fast. And um, um, so, so this in total uh, is an overview of how the CPU works. And part of the write back is that the register, the status register will be updated. The status register contains the flex and the flex contains the information if the last result was zero or not zero, if the last result was positive or negative. And you need these informations for code flow change. Your typical thing is um, you have a element on the screen, a character, you have 10 hit points, you get hit by a bullet, the damage you took is 8, you subtract from the 10 the 8, the result is 2, you write this back to your life score and you get for free as part of the instruction the information is this a positive or a negative result or are we down to zero. This means in the next instruction we can say okay if we are negative or down to zero, we jump to the game over or a you die routine. So we have the information after every calculation for free of the result reached zero or came below zero or, or still above zero. And this allows us to quickly, you know, as a programmer, switch to different subroutines. Okay, I have a, see a number of questions. Questions: Is this related to Big Endian? Yes, the 68K is a Big Endian machine, and the order that we have in memory um, is typical Big Endian order. Big Endian is used in some formats like um, IFF, the audio format, also on the Mac is Big Endian. The whole internet is a big endian, so all data which is transferred in the internet, TCP, IP, is a big endian, um, typical big endian formats. BMP, the typical Windows, ugly graphics format, is a little endian. So if you display a, a BMP picture on the Amiga, all the colors are wrong, you, you need to change, swap all the bytes. Is there a way for a developer to know if a data cache was hit or not for an instruction? Yes, um, we do have performance counters. The CPU has the possibility to measure this and you as a programmer, it doesn't make sense for one instruction, but um, you, it makes sense for subroutines. So you can, 
for a subroutine basically um, read out the statistics and see how many times data was in this subroutine for example um, used called and how many of your data accesses are hitting the cache the same we have statistic units for branches so a branch um, we didn't cover this yet we will cover this later um, is a code flow change instruction normally you start with the first instruction then the second instruction then the third instruction and now you might have a decision to make did the user press the mouse button yes or no did a bullet hit your spaceship yes or no and you decide if you want to continue on one part of the program or another part of the program and, and this is done on the 68k with branches a branch technically is like an addition to the program counter so you change the new program the program counter to point to a new address by adding an offset to it so like move a hundred cycles in that direction or move back a hundred cycle uh, instructions right so you basically p move your program counter by adding to it now uh, debug information is not available on any other 68k on the 080 you can uh, you have registers to see how many instructions how many cycles are passed so there's a cycle counter which ticks cycle 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 so this is the first simple way to see if your code is doing good you you can look at your routine you, you know how many instructions are in it how many lines you wrote and you can measure how many cycles your routine took as a first a very first overview this gives you good information if you're programmed good you know when you've programmed pretty nicely you can maybe do two instructions per cycle in average so if your code has thousands instructions and you measure you needed 500 cycle then you know you did a very good job it's running high performance if it took longer then you can drill down and look at other informations you have counters which tell you how many instructions the first pipe did execute how many instructions the second pipe did execute if you see that all the instructions are in the first pipe and none is in the second pipe then maybe you wrote very depending code that the second instruction could not use one example you increment a 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 you increment b 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 what did you do now you had like 10 instructions but the first five were depending on each other because you always did add one to number a and then the next five were also depending but also on each other because you always did work from the one instruction to the next using the same result so the two pipes cannot work efficiently if you write programs like that what you would want to do is to write increment a increment b increment a increment b increment a increment b now the two operations in your code are not depending anymore this means the decoder could put two instructions to two units to two execution units in parallel and and this would double your speed so if you see in in the debug registers that the first unit is, is working well but second unit is, is it's get bored to death you need to look how your instructions are maybe not very well sorted and often rearranging the instructions could change a lot how the performance runs if this doesn't help you you can drill deeper and can look 
at the other registers. But this is high uh, complicated stuff. We not cover this today. Let's please. Can someone darauf gehen, bitte? Ja, wird er krank was? Ja, das kann ich auch Hab ich auch Gerade eben Warte, nee, warte. So, ja. Yeah. Zieh das OBS mal weg. Das, das, das. Ja, deswegen klicke ich jetzt hier drauf. Okay. Okay, we ha let's have a quick look at the pipeline again. We see the fetch unit at the top. We see below it the decoding unit. In the O80 we have one fetch unit but the fetch unit can fetch 16 byte per cycle. And the fetch unit is a smart fetch unit. It will know how many instructions it fetched and it will put it to the right decoders. We have several decoders so we can decode several instructions in parallel. We have two EA units. We can calculate two EAs each cycle. We have one data cache unit. Only one instruction can use the memory in a cycle. So you want for optimal instruction alignment have one operation working with registers and one operation working with memory. It doesn't me need to be in any order. It doesn't need to be the first instruction working with memory and the second with uh, registers. It could be the other way around. It doesn't matter at all. But you only want one memory operation in a, a bunch of two instructions or actually in a bunch of four instructions. In theory you can do up to four instructions but only one of them can work with memory. The ALU will calculate from two inputs the result. We have again two ALUs in parallel. So you have two decoders, two instruction calculation units, one read memory unit, two ALUs and two write-back units. So everything is basically um, there twice and one instruction could read and write from memory in one operation. So you could do two more me memory operations per cycle as long as it's the same instruction doing this. Okay, let's just mount to the next one. Let's have a quick look what the ALU does. The ALU is called arithmetic unit. The arithmetic unit does all the operations, all the mathematics, which we know as instructions. Addition, multiplication, subtract, divide, a logical or, logical end, we can shift, we can exclusive order, we can rotate, we can move. So every instruction basically that you as a programmer use does an operation in the ALU. The ALU has two inputs, the first operand and the second operand, and creates one result which updates the second operand. Okay. I know this is a little bit dry and I'm sorry for that, but I believe if we get the theory first clear in every of our heads here, then everything we do later will be very simple because this is like a house. You have to start with a foundation and then build the first floor and then the roof. So here's the last part of our theoretical view. Let's look at the inputs of an instruction, what an instruction can have as inputs. An instruction can work with immediate numbers. Immediate numbers are numbers which are encoded in the instruction. This could be like <coughs> add 1 to your health counter, add 100 to your score, um, <coughs> increment the X coordinate of your spaceship. So these values you can encode in your instruction. And the 68k is very luxurious here that it supports small numbers from 1 to 8 in a very special, very quick encoding. It supports bytes, words, long words which are 32 bit, 
and it even supports bigger numbers. It can encode floating point double numbers, which are 64 bits, or the um, AMMX unit often works also directly with 64 bit immediate values. You can even encode bigger numbers in the instruction. So the 68K is super luxurious here that you can put any kind of number directly as an operand in the instruction. Very often used data registers. Data registers are very, very valuable for keeping parts of a bigger result um, component to calculate a, a, a bigger formula inside these registers in the CPU. Remember, the 68K did have eight data registers and they could contain 32 bit each. We now have 32 data registers and they can hold 64 bits. You can always, in every instruction, work with memory. This points here to the memory address hex 1200. So this would be a part of the ship memory. This is in the, in the first part of the ship memory. Um, and yeah, you, you could might have a pixel there, something stored which you show on the screen. You would ha might have some sprite uh, information there, or, or may maybe a, um, some some audio volume voice um, something you you play and listen to. But it could also be gaming data. It could be hit points. It could be high scores. It could be uh, the number of the magic item you picked up just in the dungeon. When you work with memory, we want often to point with an, um, a pointer to the memory. This is very useful for doing bulk operations, clearing the next hundred pixel, uh, filling the next hundred pixel with a certain value. So pointing with a register re there is very, very useful. Part of the op possible operation is not only pointing there, but doing a free increment as part of the operation. And the increment is smart. If you, for example, did clear the screen and you clear the byte, one byte, then the increment will automatically, by knowing that it worked with a byte, increment by one. If you clear a word, means two byte, it will increment by two. If you cleared a long, it will increment by 4. If you cleared a quad, a 64-bit value, it will increment by 8. So this unit is really smart. It can automatically, depending on what size of data you work in the memory, automatically adjust the pointer to point to the next logical value. The same also works on the other way around. You can not only increment, but you can decrement, so you can go back in your memory. And here it works just the same. Whatever type of size instruction has, you will either increment by 1, 2, 4, 8. Now, very often you have structures in memory, like Excel tables, for example. So you have a pointer to a list of values, and you want now to read the 100th byte in this list. So you can say, okay, I'm pointing here to this list of thingies and I want the 100th element in this. And the EA unit will read the pointer. It will do the addition of the 100 to come to the address to talk to the memory and it will tell the memory the result of this operation and the memory will use this. And if you work with this, something like reading as a source and writing back the result, it's both times the same pointer, EA pointer address that you are using. It will do the operation once, but it will remember the result for reading and writing back. You can in the 68K even do really complicated stuff. You can, for example, say, okay, I have a pointer pointing to um, some table like an Excel sheet. And then have an ops offset here. I want a certain part of this actually, or maybe a certain row. And now I want a certain element. And, and you say I want a element not written in the instruction, right? Not 
predefined but depending on what value is in a certain register. I can put here an address register or a data register and um, the address unit will take this into account. I can multiply this with a size value. So one, two, four, eight. And I can point to this in memory and say, okay, give me the X numbers long pointed to this table. And, and which long I want, long here is four, right? So I have the size four. And which long I use is defined in register D0. This is a super useful uh, address mode. This is very, very comfortable to use. And you people use this um, nicely on the 68K. Not all other CPUs can do this. In fact, many, many other CPUs um, have, have much, much less options in address modes. And the address modes is both a luxury for the programmer, which is wonderful, but also a, a pain in the back for the CPU developer, because every instruction can do this, and you need to test every of the 68K instructions with all the available address modes. And this is a reason <laughs> why developing a 68k takes so long because for example the power pc has maybe only 20 instructions and you t t test each of the 20 instructions and then you're done you did 20 tests okay the 68k has several different address modes i here showed the most important and most used ones there are even more. We will come to them in a later stage. Let's just focus on the most important ones. The number of address modes is over 10 on the 68K. It's actually 14. And you, you have to multiply basically you te every instruction that you have with those in your tests. So if the 68K has 20 instructions and each of them has 20, uh, 14 address modes. I don't know how many instructions is this? 20 instructions times 14 address modes. How many? Uh, 20 times 10 is 200, right? Mm -hmm. And 20 times 4 is 80? 280. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Am I, yeah. So you have 280 combinations you need to test. But all the instructions on the 68K can work on byte, on word, and long. And also the address modes will then behave differently. So you don't have to test 280, you have to test three times 280, right? So this is 1,000 things you need to test to develop a 68K instruction. No, not true. The move instruction has two EAs, so it's 14 times 14 operation it does. And you have th moves in byte, in word, and long. Oh my god! It's thousands, thousands and thousands of different combinations you need to develop to make a 68K and that you need to test while you're done with doing 20 on the power PC. This is the reason why developing a 68K takes so much longer and why Motorola did had problems to finish the ships in the same speed their new CPUs as the others doing much more simple designs. But it's at the same time the beauty Yeah, it's at the same time the beauty that you as a programmer have. Because you as a programmer you can benefit from this. You, you can code nice and easy and simple. Already coming up on two hours. Oh, damn. I really wanted to make this faster. Sorry, guys, but I hope everything is clear now. Um, please tell me if something is not clear. Does the minus sign has to be on the left side? Yes, it does. This is needed. And the, this has a very good reason. Let me explain that. 
I wish I would have a card of a dex. No, let's use the hands. Give me a hand. So, if we put values on the stack, then we put a value on, drück mal nicht so, and we, we remember, so we increment the pointer to the next address. So we put the next value on top, and the increment comes after. Nun kommt eine Hand. Okay, then the increment comes after. So now, now the pointer. The pointer points to the next free slot. So if I would put a value here, I would put and then increment. The pointer points to the next free slot. First put, then increment. If I want to take the last put element off, I cannot take and then decrement. Because then I would take an empty slot. What I need to do to take the last put value back, I need to first decrement and then take the value. This is why one way it puts first and then adds, and the other way it first decrements and then pulls. This is, a, this is very useful when you work with stacks of memory or cards or everything, right? You, you, you put a value and you point to the next free slot. You, you, you move the pointer to the slot below the used and you pull the value. So one time it's done before the operation. The next time it's done first the operation and then the increment. This is very important to understand. If you use the plus operation on a pointer, it will put the value to the location pointed to by the pointer first and after putting the value it will increment and point to the next free slot. If you pull it will go back from the free slot to the use slot and then pull. So yes, the minus needs to be on the left side. And you cannot write this differently. The syntax is defined like that. Do all these addressing modes take the same amount of time or are some slower than others? Very good question. On the original 68000 used like in an Amiga 500, uh, each of these address mode had a different speed. So a quick number like used in an add quick, which could only be 1 to 8, was kind of free. Could did not cost any extra cycles. A number being a byte or a word did cost two for two cycles extra, and the long costed eight cycles more. Using a register as an input was free. Using memory as an input did cost the time for reading the stuff from the bus. And as long as your instruction grew by having more complicated operations, as slower it became or longer it took. The higher CPUs improved this a little and basically the O40 everything became very quick but the indexed instruction, the indexed mode did cost more. So this took longer while operations like using pointers and cache under cache it became pretty fast. Um, the operation to increment was always free. So doing an increment was free even on the CPU used in an Amiga 500. Now with the 080 we try to optimize this as much as possible and everything is basically free. You can use the most complicated address mode with adding a 32-bit offset to an uh, address register plus another register multiplied by 8. This is free. All free. And you could even point there to an odd address so you could have um, read along not from a long position but from a position 7 or something where it's spanning several 
values in a funky way in memory. The CPU would rearrange this for you for free. It would fetch more bytes than you needed and jiggle them together in, in the order that it, your CPU wanted them. And this is all done as part of the um, fetch for free. So you as a programmer don't need to worry about these things anymore. You can just solve your problem with the best address mode you want. You, you do not need, um, you do not need to, to worry. Just code what you want to code. Stop counting beans, stop counting to, to worry. Make your code clean. Write your code in a way that you can read it uh, tomorrow again, that it's clean to you, that's easy to understand. Focus on solving the problem, please. Don't count beans. You, you, you should do new stuff in, in a way that it pleases you, that you can solve the problem easy. And this is where the 68K is so wonderful. It, it can really do so complicated things with just few instructions or even in just one instruction. And, and this is a very high quality, in my opinion, that basically no other CPU has. It makes you so, it empowers you as a coder so much that you can think about solving problems and you do not need to write essays of many, many instructions. And, and you do not need to split a big problem in a hundred small instructions. You can solve the problem as you want. I'm sorry we have um, spent quite a lot of time today, I see. Um, let me just give you an example on coding real quick and let us do the big programming the next time. I hope I can switch now to the Amiga here with the setup. It's, it's very complicated for me. Annie helps me. <laughs> Steck mal die Kamera aus. I, I will say goodbye um, because the input will switch now. Aber dann hören die mich nicht mehr. Oder? War das jetzt ein Fehler? Es gibt immer Verluste. <lacht> Nein, alles gut, man hat nichts. Ja? Natürlich.
kam ran? Ja. Nein, ist nicht. Doch, hat man es? Ja, man hat es. Okay, we try to get the picture back. Um. Okay, I really think we need to practice um, connecting the cameras back and forth. Next time, I promise this will be smoother. Sorry for the loss of the audio. This was unexpected. Um, what did we do just now? I showed you real quickly Apollo OS 7. And this was... Um, we, an example how to write a very simple program. We opened assembler tool, ASM1. ASM1 is very handy because it includes a text editor which you can use to write even bigger programs. Um, you can copy paste in it, you can do various things which you want to have in a text editor, you can search and replace and so on. And you can jump between compile mode and edit mode around just by pressing escape. The first thing the ASM1 will ask you is which screen mode you like to use. Typical screen mode which I picked was PAL, um, European mode like we always use on our Amiga 500, right? So this is then I, uh, the first thing you do, the next two things the uh, program will ask you is how much memory you want to give it. It will ask you if it shall take any memory or if you want it to limit to a certain address range. This is a bit of a heritage here because in the old times you might have had a non-auto-mounting -mount, memory expansion and for compiling you might have wanted to use that and leave the rest of the system memory free. Today you don't need to worry. You just press enter there and tell it pick any memory. And then it asks you how much memory you want to give it and this is um, in kilobytes and you can give it today uh, basically as much as you want. Um, now then I have wrote the program in the assembler in the assembler you have to know that you have um, labels. Labels are not put in the executable, they are the end, not instructions, but they are for programmer markers where we say, okay, I want to do this and I want this to be repeated until a certain point, until a bullet leaves the screen or until a certain time is over or I want to repeat it until a count is counted down maybe a thousand times or a million times you have to understand the CPU is very quick right the time to execute an instruction on the 60 or 80 is 12 nanoseconds so it can execute millions of instructions per second 80 million instructions if you write bad code if you write good code in theory up to 300 million instructions so it's it's a very fast cpu and you typically not need to worry about how many instructions or cycles you need and even a long loop to to clear a mi million of bytes is done in in a no time at all and we wrote three instructions the first instruction was put a value which is in a register into a sh register in on the bus. This was a register DFF180. This is a background color register of the Amiga. And we had this uh, register already on the Amiga 1000, we had it on the Amiga 4000, and we also have it on the V4. The V4 we used is a V4 which my son did solder himself. And um, you see it has the same registers so we can continue to program just like that we did in the second instruction add one to this register this means we incremented and this will create like a color rainbow effect and at the third, third instructions we did a branch a branch will 
change the program counter and in that way we could have written branch minus so and so many bytes to come back to the place where the first move instruction was right this is basically how the cpu will understand the instruction in the end it will only look at numbers and it will branch by going back so and so many bytes you or me as a programmer typically don't want to do this for me at least I, it feels much nicer to put a label uh, in the program and say okay go back to that spot and i called this label just s because i'm a lazy guy i just used a single letter as we start um in an assembler you have the labels in the first column and in the second column you have the instructions you need to mind this there are many coding examples also on our website if you try to recreate them if you write them on your computer if you take the excellent hardware reference manual from the uh, Edison Wesley um, for the Amiga they are also very good examples how to make a music make uh, uh, some animation show something on the screen if you type them in please always remember the labels are on the very left side and put a tap a tap before each instruction if you not put a tap before an instruction and write it to the left side the assembler will think you're defining a label so if you have say, a move instruction, it will make it a move label. And you will wonder yourself, hey, why doesn't my, my program not end? I put a return instruction into it, but if you don't put it in the right column, it will be executed or regarded as a return label and it will do nothing. So remember this, this is a typical beginner's mistake. With the escape key, right, the escape, on the keyboard escape key you jump between program mode and compile mode edit mode and compile mode a compiles the program g j like jack will start it you can with asm1 do a lot of things you can snoop into memory you can disassembly memory you can disassembly uh, programs with it you can also single step your program you can go into a program you can step by step see what each instruction does and it will also show you the content of every register step by step this is very nice for a beginner to test its, its routine you can verify what your code does and where your program goes so it's basically a complete development environment and it's pretty cute and it's there since the 80s asm1 or the father of asm1 which was called seeker was was already there when i started coding and um i mean it's a dinosaur but it's useful and we will probably con continue to use it until the end of time. Let's quickly answer some questions. Yes, sorry for the audio. I um, yeah, there is a switching bit between camera on and um, the V4. We need to practice this, and for the next uh, lesson a bit more, we will also uh, do with you more examples. For today, I think we we covered or we, we spent all the time that we we wanted to to have the course, and um, I can give you as a hint um, or as a guidance. Please have a look at Arnie's uh, assembly lessons. He made videos on YouTube, and he, he wrote a number of small programs, showing a screen, playing music, making a sinus scroller. You can take a look at them, you can on YouTube uh, pause the video and read them if you want. You can also go to our website and um, can you share the screen and open the website here on this browser for me, Arne? Arne is a computer master. Okay, 
So let's hope this works. We are now on the Apollo Core website. And here, of course, we have our, um, we are cooler than everyone, and we have so many features that the other CPUs didn't have um, page, but you know all this already. Here, we have the coding session. And the coding session has here hints to coding examples which my son uh, did and made some nice videos of them. You can watch them in detail, uh, see on YouTube or here how the effect will look and you can also read the source. On the second tab we have here small snippets of coding bits. Here for example, here we have um, an example how to make music on the Amiga. We move with the move instruction the start address of the audio we want to play into a register DFF 400. This is a pointer register of the first audio channel. We then tell it how many samples we want to play. Okay, and the register to write this information to is the register DFF 404. We then set the volume register and the volume register has volume, a byte volume for the left and for the right side of the channel. And we set both volumes here with one move to the maximum. Okay, why have less than the maximum? And here this register defines the sample rate. Um, 80 is here a magic number, it basically says this uh, to hold each sample for 80 um, polar ticks. A polar is clocked at uh, 3.5 megahertz and if you repeat each note 80 times and then play the next sample, this is effectively a sample rate of 44 kilohertz. This is DVD quality. Okay, then we have a register which defines the mode. It could be 8-bit mode, then you, we put in 0 in here. We could switch this to 16-bit or 32-bit stereo mode. We can put different numbers here. They have different effects. And then we tell Agnes, so this was all for the audio ship, right? And so now we speak to another register, and this register is in Agnes the DMA controller, you recall the octopus, give DMA permission to Paula. Please provide the audio ship with the DMA enabled channel. And by doing this, the audio will play and you can play whatever size you want. It could be a 100 byte long file, it could be a kilobyte long file or a 100 megabyte long file. It doesn't matter. You can play any size of music on the vampire. So if you want to understand more how, what these type of instructions do and how they function, then you will find a very good overview here. Here quickly we explain the number of registers we have. We have 32 data registers, 32 FPU registers, 16 address registers. We explain again what address modes we have. Okay. I did not cover those below, they are a bit complicated, To I did not cover them today, but we spoke about in the value direct, the data register, um, pointed memory with, with the um, address pointer, with increment or decrement. And here come an overview of all instructions the CPU supports. These are the normal integer instructions and they are here also explained, right? And they are grouped into certain groups. We have bit operations, these are bit operations. We have the normal arithmetic stuff, add, minus, compare, multiply, divide. We have operations, these here in this area, which are only valid for the uh, address units. The address units can use them to manipulate address registers. And here we have instructions which are for code flow, jumping to a subroutine, returning from a subroutine, if you have written something in basic, like a go sub. Okay, and here's the move instruction. And there's always an explanation what the instruction does. 
and for some uh, instructions there are also examples. We have a tab for the AMX instructions, we have a tab for the FPU instructions, so this will help you, hopefully. And here we also have um, the registers of the Amiga explained and they are color coded. Graphic registers are red, bright registers are yellow. And here, what is this register? I, I poked to this was a register DFF 180. This is a background color register. And here is explained which part of the register has which value. So here is the blue, the green, and the red uh, amount of your color that you poke to. So, machen wir wieder zurück. So thank you very much for um, for all your patience and all your listening. Uh, you can read there a lot more and get a glimpse. You can as always ask questions uh, in, in our Discord channel. We will be for the next time go really in detail. We will write real examples. Um, it would be nice if you can review what you um, learned today and, and uh, try to understand the, the address modes because we will start to use them next time. And I hope then it's clear what they do. We will write uh, small programs, we will uh, play music, we will make a scroller or something like that. Um, we will ask for the, the uh, fire button of the joystick and make a bullet on the screen flying from one side to the other. So parts that you can reuse in the demos or maybe in your next game. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, please uh, continue to use the Amiga uh, and I hope you had as much fun as me today and I hope you will continue to have much more fun with your Amiga starting to program. Good night everyone. Winky, winky. Good night. Take care, see you soon.